everyone, and welcome to our newest uh, version of this style of webinar, which is called Lee's Lessons. So this is the first of Lee's Lessons. We'll be having about six of them throughout this year. So get, you know, definitely get ahead of this and start registering for them now. We'll have a registration page coming out with all of the sessions within the next two weeks. So keep an eye on that. Um, just a heads up, I've been experiencing some issues with audio and video connectivity coming in a little slow from time to time. So I apologize in advance if that happens again. Um, but let us know in the Q&A chat. We will do everything we can to help alleviate those issues and just be being aware of them helps as well. So we can do some refreshing of our screens if we need to. Um, but definitely let us know using the Q&A chat box. Um, and just to get into the housekeeping stuff so we can get right to the content today. Um, like I mentioned, I'm experiencing some connectivity issues, but let me know if you're experiencing them on your end as well. Again, like I mentioned, use the Q&A chat to let us know what those issues are. Also, use that Q&A chat to ask us any questions. Ask our expert, Lee, um, and his during his lessons today, we'll be talking about a lot. Um, so definitely let us know if you have any questions, and we have time dedicated at the end of this session to answer those questions. Uh, big ticket item, if we do see any connectivity issues or if you're experiencing any issues on your end that we can't alleviate while watching this webinar, we are recording it, and the recording will come out clean. Um, so definitely let it, we will, sorry, we will share that recording within 48 hours after we conclude today. So definitely keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, there's not going to be any slides. We're going to show maybe one thing, um, wink, wink, nod, nod. So when we call that out, definitely um, check out your screen. But I know that there's a lot of video fatigue out there. Trust me, I run a webinar program, so I totally get it. Um, so if you feel like you want to just sit back and listen to this or get some other work done while you're listening to listening to us, um, that is also fine. Nothing too major to, that you'll need to check out. And we'll let you know and give you a heads up when there is something we want you to look at. Well, awesome. Becca, people aren't allowed to multitask during this program. Absolutely no? not. Come on, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well try, not to on, <laughs> try not to multitask too much, there, folks. But if you have questions, make sure you jot those down, and we'll answer them at the end of this lesson for today. Um, and then a couple of other things, just resources. Um, we have a couple of lists. Um, a list of a couple of resources um, also on your screen that we'll have you check out later in the program, um, but feel free to check those out at any point in time. All right, last housekeeping item. Zoom Info is a publicly traded company. This presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Any buying decisions you make should be made based only upon currently available products and offerings. This is our Zoom Info's complete safe harbor statement here for your review if you'd really like to. Um, it's pretty fine print and I'm going to move on in just a moment. So, okay. So as we mentioned, our speaker for today is Lee Sauls. We are covering Lee's lessons and the Lee's lessons for today is on price objections. Never lose again. Um, Lee Sauls, he's a sales management strategist, best-selling author of sales differentiation. Um, for today, Lee's lessons, like I mentioned, on resolving the price issue. This program is based on one of his newest books, Sell Different, All New Sales Differentiation Strategies to Outsmart, Outmaneuver, and Outsell the Competition. Lee, thanks so much for being here. Love being here. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to jump right into it and get to the heart of this issue. Lee, how do you overcome the price objection? All right, Rebecca, really? You want to go there, huh? All right, let me yes. get ready. All right, now I'm ready for this conversation. You ready? I think so. I don't, see your I, gloves think so. On. I don't have my gloves see, with me. You didn't warn me. <laughs> see, when we see the selling world through the lens of objections, we hear one thing, one message. Let's fight. You're either buying or you're crying. And, and here's what's interesting. Most salespeople talk about their ability to build relationships. And let me tell you, that ain't happening when your approach is to overcome objections. I mean, think about this. We say we overcome objections and build relationships. So we're going to fight this out and expect a hug afterwards. Folks, that's not going to happen. But what if we see this not as an objection, but rather as someone sharing a concern? We put away the boxing gloves, right? And then what we do is rather than hear let's fight we've heard let's help me help me and we sit on the same side of the desk as them and help navigate the issue and this may seem subtle it's not 
it's a completely different mind shift when you go from hearing, let's fight, to help me. And that shift helps you be more effective when working through that price issue. Okay. So I know salespeople are hypersensitive to the subject of price. No, no they're not <laughs> hypersensitive at all. No, 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 no. From my experience working on the trade show floor, a marketer is not allowed to talk about price in any way, shape, or form. So we always just pass them off to the salesperson when they're ready to talk price. Um, but I, so I guess, I guess maybe I know a little bit more about this question or answer to this question than most. Hopefully they do understand this question in the audience, but does price really matter? Well, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, Rebecca. Price 100% matters. Look, none of you in this masterclass is willing to pay one penny more for something that you perceive to be exactly the same as something else. None of us are. So the key is to differentiate. So when you can demonstrate meaningful value to prospects, note the word meaningful, they're willing to spend more. I mean, think about this. If price was truly the driving decision factor, we'd all wear the cheapest clothes, have the cheapest phones, drive the cheapest cars, use the cheapest toilet paper, use the cheapest razor blades and sit in the worst seats at the ball game. But we don't do that, do we? When we come across meaningful value, we gladly open our wallets and pay for it. So that's the key. We have to differentiate what we sell and how we sell in a meaningful way so that prospects perceive the intended value of our offerings. And those opportunities to differentiate in a meaningful way, they're, they're meaning, they're, I'm sorry, that means they're endless, endless. Okay, so what should a salesperson do um, when they hear a prospect say, your price is too high? Run. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone pay attention to this. Super important. There was a study done by a well-respected consulting firm it was a study of over 10,000 sales calls focused specifically on the price issue. 10,000 sales calls. And overwhelmingly, there was one factor that led to the price becoming an issue. And Rebecca, do you know what that driving factor was? No. Want to guess? <laughs> uh, mm, no, I wouldn't want to guess wrong. <laughs> Oh, come on, this is easy. It's because the prospect was a jerk. No, I'm just oh, kidding. Really? Oh. There, there was no study. But I'll bet all of you are nodding and laughing, going, yeah, that's right, they were a jerk. That's why there was a price issue. And why were we laughing? Because when the price issue comes up, who do we always blame? The prospect. It's their fault that they don't perceive meaningful value in what we're selling. It never dawns on us that the responsibility of a prospect receiving meaningful value, oh, there's that expression again, meaningful value, that that responsibility falls on our shoulders. So when prospects push back on price, what they're really doing is giving you constructive criticism. So if you think in terms of a scale, right, on one side is price, the other side is meaningful value. When the price issue comes up, what they've just told you is that you have not demonstrated enough meaningful value to justify the price that you put in front of them. It, it really is, it's constructive criticism. So rather than become defensive, we need to take it to heart. And if you hear it enough, if you're hearing that issue enough, you need to retool the approach so that prospects perceive enough value in the offer that they're willing to buy it at the prices that you want. Okay, so are there steps salespeople should follow to effectively navigate that price concern? Absolutely, and, and it's not just a price concern. There are steps to be followed for all what I call deal obstacles, call them concerns, objections, stalls. There is a process for that, and so let's talk about that. So because many salespeople see this issue through the lens of objections, again, they wanna defend their position and get ready for a fight, and so what do they do? They just start tossing out information and they hope that something's going to stick, right? Something's going to change the decision. But let me tell you, nothing good comes from being defensive, at least not if you both want to win the deal and have a relationship with that individual afterwards. So rather than become defensive, the first step we should take is to show empathy. 
So you start with a simple expression like, I appreciate you sharing that with me, or thank you for bringing that up. Again, this is the first step for any deal obstacle, not just the price one. It's subtle, but it shows you care, it shows you're listening, and it sets the tone for a non-defensive, constructive conversation. You know what else it does? It gives you a moment to think about the direction you want to take the conversation. It's a few moments that you get when you show empathy, but it lets you think a little bit about where you want to go. Now, many salespeople think now's the time to throw a bunch of information out there and see what sticks. It's not. The next step is to ask questions to understand their perspective of our price. So start with a question like, may I ask what you're comparing our price to? Why is that so important? Well, there's a lot of reasons why the price issue comes up. It could be comparing to their budget, compared to another proposal that may not be the same as yours, uh, comparing to what they're paying today, and a whole host of other possibilities. Without knowing that answer, there is no way to properly navigate this issue. You're gonna be throwing spaghetti at the wall hoping something sticks. Now, back when I was in college in a fraternity house, that's how we made pasta. You take the pasta, throw it against the wall, see if it sticks. And, and that worked, by the way. If you haven't done that, you probably don't want to do that in a nice home. But if the pasta sticks to the wall, it's done. Doesn't work in sales. So by asking this question, may I ask what you're comparing our price to, you find out the comparison point. And then based on that, you can take the steps to laser in on the root cause and work through the issue. Okay, so what do you recommend sales do when a prospect asks for a price early in the conversation before they've had a chance to, dif I guess, before you've had a chance to di differentiate yourself? Ah, yeah, that's a pickle, isn't it, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. So early in the conversation, the prospect says, how much is it? Now you got two choices, right? You tell them and you lose because you haven't demonstrated meaningful value yet. Or you say, I'm not telling you and you lose because they got angry and left. So here's your bottom line. If you allow that price question to come up, you got trouble. So with all deal obstacles, as we talked about, concerns, objections, stalls, including this price one, I look at it this way. If the issue comes up more than 50% of the time, you can't just bury your head in the sand and go, oh my gosh, I hope it goes away. I hope it doesn't come up. It's on their mind. So we've got to be proactive about it and address it before they bring it up. See, because if they bring it up, you have to respond. And as you know, respond by definition is a defensive posture. So when it comes to price, you know that question's on their mind. So don't let it come up. Early in the conversation, tell them, tell them when you're going to share that pricing information. So Rebecca, let me give you an example. The mortgage industry. So what's the big question, Rebecca, on everyone's mind when you're calling about a mortgage? What's the big question? What do you want to know? Interest rate. Right. You want to know the rate. That's their pricing question. So you're a mortgage salesperson. You got two choices when they ask that. You tell them the rate and you lose and the prospect hangs up, shops it elsewhere. Or you refuse to tell them and you lose because the person gets irritated and hangs up. So what top mortgage salespeople do is they don't let the question come up. Early in the conversation, they say, I'm sure a big question on your mind is, what's your rate? Again, the price. And you're probably thinking of that 30-year fixed rate mortgage. It's understandable. That's the program that everyone knows. What you may not realize is that there are over 100 different mortgage programs available in this country. Each one is a proper fit with homeowners, with qualifying criteria, and of course, a rate. And at this point, I don't even know which program to talk with you about. But if we could talk for a few minutes, I'll be able to narrow down from that universe of available programs to the right ones to consider and, of course, share the rate for those programs. Would that be okay? And if you think about what that strategy does, it diffuses that premature price request because we proactively address the point. They just told the prospect when pricing is going to be discussed and can now have a productive conversation learn about the prospect and their goals and desires, and have an opportunity to differentiate yourself. So that's what all salespeople need to do up front. Set the expectation for when pricing is going to be shared, and that helps to neutralize what I call premature pricing requests. Okay, so where does a target
target client profile come into play when it comes to the price concern? Yeah, it plays a huge part. The target client profile serves a number of purposes, and one of the main ones is to understand who will perceive meaningful value in what you sell. Now, you're probably not accustomed to the expression of target client profile. You'd probably call it an ideal client profile. Well, I didn't just change the wording of it. There's a significant difference. See, an ideal client profile says to salespeople, if all the stars were to align, this is the type of account we'd love to have. It's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's like the lottery. A target client profile says, this is the type of account to pursue all day long because they will perceive meaningful value in what we sell. Now I'm gonna be the bearer of bad news, Rebecca. Not everyone's a good prospect for you. They're not. Not everyone sees meaningful value in what you sell, which means they won't wanna pay your price. So why waste time chasing them? So your target client profile helps you hone in on the right prospects, the ones who will perceive meaningful value in what you offer, so you invest your selling time on deals that have the highest likelihood to come to fruition. You all know this. Salespeople are paid for results, not work. We get paid for effectiveness. It's one of the few professions compensated that way. So we need to work smart, not just hard and your target client profile gives you the foundation. It helps you know the circumstances where you'll be most effective, which means successful. Now, if you don't have a target client profile, got some good news for you. Got a template. You know you come here, you don't leave empty handed. So Rebecca, can you share my target client profile uh, on screen yes. and in the chat? Yes, exactly. So um, I'm not going to throw it in the chat, but everybody right below our window, there's a list of resources. It is the first resource on that list. It's a PDF that you can click the link to download. Um, and I am going to share it on my screen right now. It might be a little small. Feel free, um, audience members, to expand the size of the window. Um, it's loading right now. So feel free to expand the size of the window. This is as large as I can get. So Lee, you tell me how to navigate. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So there's nine components. And by the way, you need a target client profile for each product service technology. We'll just use the general term product to describe it that you offer because the audience and the circumstances around it could be different. So the first component is size. And size is whatever way you define size in your industry. So maybe it's units, revenue, employee count, number of hires, number of, of uh, units that they might purchase. So size is the first component in setting your criteria. The second one is a location consideration. Where's your brand strong? Or is there a particular growth area that you're targeting? Where's their headquarters or their field locations? Address location as it's specific and as it's relevant in your industry. Maybe there's certain types of businesses that you say, boy, this type of business really sees value in what we're offering. So you'd want a list of various business types that you think would really understand those meaningful differentiators. You also want to talk a bit about incumbent. So for example, uh, who they're using today, maybe they're doing something themselves that they could outsource to you and have more opportunity when doing that. Circumstances and goals. This is an important piece of that profile. So imagine starting a sentence like this. Our target client has issues with blank, has a desire to blank, has challenges with blank, has compliance priorities, including, has management initiatives, including. So that's what we put in that section around circumstances and goals. Then we move to the next page, which are decision drivers. These are the events that would lead someone to pick up their head and consider an alternative to what they're doing today. And again, I give you several examples. A new executive being hired, there's an acquisition, expansion, relocation, et cetera. Anything that would lead them to be receptive to a conversation about what you offer. Then there's corporate attributes. There are some clients I work with that say, if the company doesn't have really strong financials, we don't wanna work with them. Others that say, we really want the businesses that are struggling, they're a great fit for us. Or maybe it's company culture and looking for that alignment. 
So that's what goes in the corporate attributes section. Then the buying process, how they buy, who's involved. So for example, if you know the one that's really gonna understand your meaningful value is the CFO, because there's strong ROI of what you're selling. When you talk about the buying process, need to have the CFO involved because this is someone that's really gonna be intrigued by what we offer. There's also, you'll notice at the end of that section, active versus passive buyer. We all say we want leads, like where are the leads? Well, if you have an active buyer, means they've contacted you. They've probably also talked to two, three, four, five of your competitors, other players in your space. And the conversation with them would be very different than a passive buyer that you motivate to look at a particular scenario, a process, a technology, whatever that might be, and you're the one leading that charge. And some of you are better positioned in an active scenario versus a passive one. And again, you want to identify that in your profile. Where are you going to be the most successful? And the last section, section nine, is deal breakers. It's almost the converse of your target client profile. These are the things you say, you know what, if we've got this, we're out. We're not going to waste our time chasing it. Some of you may put the dreaded three letters, RFP, there. If they only buy through RFP, or I should even I'll add a word, a blind RFP, meaning it just shows up on your desk, you have no relationship, we're out. Because we know we won't have a chance to demonstrate meaningful value, and we're going to lose. So those are the nine components. And the better clarity you have on that target client profile, the more effective you're going to be when selling, and the less you're going to encounter the price issue, because you will have an opportunity to demonstrate meaningful value with an individual in an account that says, ah, I get it. This makes sense to me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lee. Um, and audience members, as a reminder, that um, document you can download. It's right in a list of resources right below our screen. So you should be able to just click on the first link. And that is this target client profile. So definitely check that out, download it and use it. Um, also let Lee know or myself know in the Q&A if you guys have any questions on that doc, um, feel free to submit those as well. So, um, so right, you Lee, came to a master class and now you got homework. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Homework that you don't need to share, but homework that benefits you. So um, definitely oh, we'll check it out. You. That's okay. <laughs> hey, give Lee a call and he'll give you a grade for it. So um, perfect. Okay. So um, Lee, for several sales types, there's a strong total cost of ownership and return on investment story to be positioned. Um, what mistake do you find salespeople commonly make with those? Great question. Kind of reminds me of a story with my daughter, Jamie, just recently graduated from University of North Dakota. And I remember when she was first looking for a college apartment, she found this one building. It was an absolute palace. But when she was telling me about it, really cautious because she thought it was financially out of reach. She goes, Dad, this place is really amazing. There's a gym on the first floor. Each apartment's fully furnished. And every bedroom and living room has a flat screen TV. But it's $100 a month more than this other place I'm looking at. I said, well, tell me about the other place. So, well, it's nice, but it's unfurnished. There's no TVs, no gym. And she was resigned to signing a lease at the so-called cheaper place. But I asked her, why do you think that apartment is cheaper? And she thought it was nuts. She said, because it's $100 lower rent than the other place. I said, well, okay, that's true. But don't you have to buy a bedroom and living room furniture? She goes, well, yeah. How about a TV? You need that? Well, actually, no, we need one for the bedrooms and, and for the living room. I said, okay. And you're going to work out, so you need a gym membership. Said, well, yeah, that's true. So I sat down with her and I ran all the numbers and lo and behold, this so-called cheaper apartment was actually more expensive. And her eyes light up, gives me a big hug, and she signed a lease for the apartment that she wanted. I'll tell you what, someone at that apartment complex owes me a commission check because I did their sales job. See, the mistake so many salespeople make is that they hope and pray that their prospects will on their own perceive a strong ROI or TCO, so return on investment and, and total cost of ownership. Unless there's a dad like me that is facilitating the analysis, 
probably not going to happen on their own. So the burden is on us in sales to demonstrate that ROI and TCO in writing. Well, why do we have to do it in writing? Well, over two thirds of the population is visual. So if you're only describing it verbally, two thirds of the population is not going to grasp it. Plus, when you just say, oh, there's a strong ROI in this, it's not believable. Every salesperson says that. You've got to show them the numbers in writing so that they can understand it and buy into it. So you walk them through the numbers, help them see the value that you truly represent, and that's how you get prospects excited about your meaningful value. Now, I'm often asked when it comes to developing these models, how do you do it? Like, they don't necessarily want to tell you their numbers, which, you know, trust issue. They feel like if they tell you their numbers, you're going to charge them more. So when you build the model, put placeholder data in that so that if they don't want to tell you or they don't know, based on your uh, historical expertise in the space, you can run with the numbers that you have. So you populate the model based on your historical expertise and then edit it, customize it based on what you can learn from your prospect. And that brings the whole exercise to life so that they can see the demonstrable ROI and TCO and what you're offering. All right, so I've heard you talk about a test or test buyers give to salespeople. Um, mm -hmm. What is that test? <laughs> uh, the flinch test, a fan favorite. Actually, it's a buyer favorite. This is a test professional buyers give to salespeople, and it goes like this. So you present your proposal and they say, oh my gosh, I didn't think it would be this expensive. Now, none of you in this masterclass has ever had that experience, I'm sure. Well, folks, when they do that, they're testing your commitment to the price that you put in front of them. And you know what? They should. If you show fear or a lack of confidence in your price, you're done. And guess what? More than a few salespeople flinch when they hear that, and they're done. So let me give you three responses that will make you fail the flinch test. So they react like I just said, oh, my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be that high. Here's three responses that means you fail the flinch test. Number one, what price were you looking for? Number two, I'll ask my manager if we can do better. Number three, how about if I take 10% off? You know, the funny thing, Rebecca, is that salespeople think that their prospects see them as heroes when they take 10% off just because they were asked to do so. What you've actually done, you've destroyed any trust that they had in you. Because now they're thinking, you jerk, you're trying to rip me off. Guaranteed, they don't see you as a hero. Now, how would you all like to add 20% to your earnings? Whatever you made last year, you look at this year, regardless of what you sell, I can add 20% to your earnings. Every time you go to buy something and a salesperson puts a price in front of you, give them the flinch test. You will be amazed. You'll be amazed how quickly they drop their prices. It's even your utilities. Call the cable company, call Direct TV, and you tell them, oh boy, you know, looking at this price, yeah, boy, this is uh, higher than I want. Guess what? Yesterday, I was told, oh, we can give you a $30 a month credit for the next year. I wasn't even really asking, I was talking about a service issue. You will be amazed. I know I've added 20% to my earnings just by reacting, oh my gosh, I didn't think it would be this expensive. So when you present your price, do it with confidence. And that's with your words, your tone, your body language. You've got to sell your price. And by the way, if you don't believe what you're selling is worth the price tag that's on it, go find another sales job. You've got no business selling that, that product. Okay, so I think you hinted at a couple of examples within just that little bit there, but um, how do sales, how do top salespeople deal with the flinch test? Well, several things. First of all, if you're not the low price provider, set that expectation up front. So you'd say something like, our company is rarely the low bid. Does that mean we won't be working together on this project? If they say no, you're prepared for later phases of the process. If they say yes, you don't waste time chasing deals. That won't happen. Remember, you get paid for effectiveness, not hard work. The second thing is they don't flinch. They'll say something like, I'm not surprised by your reaction. Hear that a lot. As I mentioned at the outset, we're rarely the low bidder. 
Should we walk through the proposal again and make sure you're comparing apples to apples? And this is the opportunity you have to remind them of your differentiators and the meaningful value your solution provides. Number three, they seek to understand. They'll ask, when you say that you're shocked by the price, which part is surprising to you? See, you need to know what part of the pricing they feel is out of line so you can appropriately address it. Number four, they reinforce the position. They ask, since we're rarely the low price provider, what do you think our thousands of clients see in us or whatever number you have relative to the competition? That leads them to pay a little more to have our solution. And this question helps prospects reconsider their perspective on that pricing for your solution. One last point about the flinch test. Here's a negotiation key. If you're gonna give something, you need to get something. If you're gonna give something, you need to get something. If you're gonna make a price concession, you've gotta get something in return, something like increasing the size of the order, uh, accelerating payment, extending length of the purchase agreement, uh, reducing the scope or maybe adjusting requirements that are that are in there, uh, taking delivery when you want, maybe it's earlier or later than you proposed, facilitating introductions to senior executives and other business units or to colleagues in other companies. Maybe it's participating in an interview to put together a case study or serving as a reference when you need them. These are just some examples of ways that it becomes a win-win deal rather than you just giving up margin. Every deal must yield two more. You've heard me talk about that in the business developer's mantra. And when you talk about negotiation, if you're going to give something, you need to get something. All right. So one final question here, um, and it's, it's a little controversial one, but um, there are several sales training programs out there, and they have all their own way of dealing with uh, price issues. What is the best sales training program you have come across? Uh, get that question a lot. And most people expect me to name one of the world's top sales training firms and are always surprised by my answer. So a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in the best sales training ever. It was awesome. It was procurement training. Think of it as sales training for buyers. I felt like a spy because I was learning the methods professional buyers were being taught to use when procuring products and services. I learned how they were taught to evaluate a supplier's quality management system, as well as their perspective of pricing. Rebecca, you know what I found? They're not being taught to buy cheap. They're oh, being no. taught to evaluate quality to make sure, remember that scale I mentioned, meaningful value and price. And so during a break, I had an interesting conversation with the instructor about this whole price issue. And here's what he told me. He goes, you know, for 25 years, salespeople have asked me for coaching on the price of their proposal since I was the head of procurement for my company. I told all of them the same thing. Give us the best price that you feel good about giving us, and either way, you're happy. And I always got a puzzled response from that response. He went on to explain, if we award the business to you at that price, you're happy. If we award the business to someone else at a lower price, you're happy as well because you wouldn't have been happy to support our account at that price point. Boy, that sure made me think. I love the program so much, I actually brought that procurement trainer into two companies over the years when I was head of sales, and it was pure gold. Now, of course, you all want to know his name. Well, unfortunately, this was over 20 years ago, and he has since retired. But there are a number of procurement trainers out there, and I highly recommend finding them and having them talk with your salespeople. In addition, in addition to that, invest time understanding what your differentiators are and how to communicate them in a meaningful way with target clients. So there's three pieces to that puzzle. Determine what your differentiators are, develop communication strategies for them so that the person on the other side of the desk is just as excited about those differentiators as you are and put together your target client profile so you focus your selling time on those who will perceive meaningful value in your differentiators. Awesome, always Lee, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, audience members, there's a couple of questions that came through early on and I think some of them were actually answered. 
Okay. Um, but I will maybe toss up one of them to you. But definitely, audience members, feel free to submit questions as they come up. We have this time to use. Um, so definitely let us know if there's any questions. Utilize that Q&A chat box. Um, if any questions come up after we conclude today, definitely shoot uh, myself or Lee Sauls an email. Uh, you can follow and respond to any of the promotional emails with, that you've received and registered from this session on. But definitely let us know if you have any questions outside of this. So Lee, one question that came in super early on, you definitely answered it at the end here, I think, um, but okay. I think we can twist it to be a little bit different. So they basically asked, do buyers, and so uh, these days a lot of the buyers are procurement officers, so they tend mm -hmm. to, they were asked, do buyers go through training to learn how to object to pricing? And I would say that procurement, like you mentioned, is probably one of those buyers that they're considering, um, but, I guess the question really is, yes, I would say answer, the answer to the question is yes, technically. It depends on who you're talking to, if they go through any kind of training to object to price. Um, and then the second part of that question is, um, are they told what salespeople will do to justify the price? And I don't know if any of that came through in your procurement training, but if you can answer it, I think that would be an interesting question to answer. Yeah, so it's not just procurement agents that go through that training. It's anybody that does purchasing on behalf of the organization uh, with any uh, with, with a high level of frequency, they go through that. I mean, look, if, if you were an executive in a company, and some of you are, you know, when you're head of sales, you're an executive in the company, and there's an expectation that you're going to protect the company. So when you're buying products and services, you put your buyer hat on, and you ask questions. You know, sometimes someone says, um, is this the best price? That's another way that, that you get the flinch test. They're just asking a question because they have that responsibility on behalf of their company. And if you say, yep, this is our best number, okay, great, and you get the deal done. It doesn't mean you have to negotiate. It's just a question. It's not an objection. It's not a concern, not a stall. It's just a question. And we get that question, and so many of us get defensive and go, okay, got to get the boxing gloves back on. Here we go. So... That's a responsibility that anyone that's in executive capacity has to protect the business and make sure they don't pay one penny more than necessary for the solution that they need. Awesome. Okay. This is an interesting question. I, it's, um, I, in my opinion, it might be splitting hairs, but I know that there's different departments for new business acquisition in um, some, some companies versus um, account management or account expansion underneath the same sales org. But this, so this person is specifically looking at um, asking a question around best practices to create um, receptivity on part of clients for add-ons to their core product that they've already decided to buy. Um, so any okay. kind of best practices around, I guess, growing within a current customer. So what we're talking about is scope creep. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like, where we said, okay, here's the, the scope of the deal, and we put a price on it, and now they've expanded the scope but they still want this price. And so we have to have a very candid conversation with them and, and really give them two choices. We will give them this scope for this price, or we will give them the new scope for a different price. But if you give them that new scope for the prior price, for that lower price, you come across as being mistrustful, right? Because you just said this is the price for this and now you want to do all this other stuff for the same price so we want to have a relationship with them long term but we just did something that leads them to believe that we're not trustworthy mm -hmm. like i said if you're going to give something you have to get something okay so this is a little bit of a broader scope question for you um Definitely looking to get your thought leadership uh, information out of you. Um, so this person, his name is Jason. He's asking, how do you see the future of sales with things going digital and the removal of the face-to-face -face meetings per se? How will we adjust? It's a very good question. Um, obviously, it's outside the uh, the scope of uh, what we really got into. But let me give you a, a summarized explanation. The first thing is... Virtual selling is not going away. It's buyers love it, and companies have found that their salespeople are more effective, more efficient when they don't have to jump in cars and, and get in, get on planes. What you're going to see happen, and I'm already seeing it happen today, is we're becoming much more circumstantial where we say, for this deal, can we get it done virtually, or do we need to jump in a car? Do we need to get in a plane 
to get it done. So you're seeing that that type of a trend where we're being much more circumstantial and saying, what's the best strategy to get this deal done? Okay, I like that. Um, so it's kind of that hybrid model, potentially just taking a little bit, you know, understanding yeah. individuality with the each buyer or prospect, but definitely giving the option for the hybrid model. Um, okay, cool. So this other question is kind of an interesting one. Um, so this is from Dave. How do you handle an account that you've inherited that is clearly price, not value driven? Great so. question. Are you trying to sell them more or what? And I, I need to know what the initiative is of what you're trying to do there. Yeah, so if I you don't... can add a little bit more color in that, we'll come back to that question. Perfect. Yeah. So Dave, feel free to submit um, just a little bit more clarity on that one. Um, okay. Um, let's see. We've got a lot of good questions that are coming in. Um, question 19 looks interesting. Yeah. You want to go with that one? Okay. Question 19. Do you feel like salespeople should have the authority to lower price without management approval? And what, when I manage sales teams, my preference was for salespeople not to have price control. And that was in circumstances where they needed to be the relationship manager. I found it to be a conflict of interest when my salesperson deals with price and I want them to be the relationship person. I wanted to be the bad guy in, in the management seat and let them be the intermediary between the company and the, the prospect or, or the client in some situations. So, I, I, my preference was to put that burden on me. It didn't mean that I didn't consult with the salesperson or I didn't involve them with this, but I wanted to take that burden off of them to use that as a way to build closer relationships with their prospects and clients. All right. Okay. Dave gave us some clarification. Um, so he okay. is the original question just for everybody to remember is how do you handle an account that you've inherited that is clearly price not value driven in his clarification he's trying to keep the account not lose it and hopefully expand our offerings at the account so really just trying to make sure that yeah. they're keeping it consistent and i would assume that when he's trying to yeah. not lose the account means that maybe price goes up at some cadence okay so uh, an interesting question to ask the, this individual assuming that uh, they were the ones that made the decision initially. Since you're new with the account, I would ask them, say, just curious, all those years ago, what led you to select our company and this solution? And get them talking about it. And if they say it was low price, then you have an opportunity to educate them around the meaningful value that you offer today, maybe that you didn't offer way back when. But the first step is to understand why they picked your company and your solution in the first place, and then what value they've experienced from it over time. If I knew more about what, what you were selling, I could be more specific, but maybe that gives you enough. But the, the first step is to understand why they picked you in the first place, and then um, use that as an opportunity to position those meaningful differentiators that you have today that maybe you didn't have back then. Okay. I like this question and I, I don't know, it's a little off topic compared to what we're talking price right now, but um, I think it's, it, it could be interesting to hear what your response is. It's the, the newest question that came in. Um, what is the role or in your, so again, our audience members, we're answering this based off of Lee's opinion. So it's definitely not um, take it, you know, for fact in any way, but definitely opinion. And he's got a lot of experience so we can we can take it somewhat on fact, but um, what is the role of the CEO versus the VP of sales and enabling the best possible sales function in the organization? Um, I personally think it's based on a company size. You might not have a B VP of sales. You might only have a CEO. You might have um, a director of sales. So I think specifically on like that type of level and that type of area, what is their um, you know best possible sales function for the organization or enabling that? So I'm going to go down the path assuming that this is a company that has a CEO and a VP of sales. <clears throat> okay. The CEO's role, and, and, it, and this is one of the challenges for VPs of sales, CEOs sometimes look at sales, particularly if they don't have a sales background, as 
You just hire great salespeople. They should be able to come in and prospect and bring in deals, and we don't have any responsibility whatsoever. The challenge is, as you all know, that model doesn't work. So a CEO to appreciate and understand and be willing to invest in sales enablement, that's what I want from my, from my CEO if I'm the VP of sales. The VP of sales responsibility is, and, and I'm gonna operate on the assumption in this case that there isn't a sales enablement role in place, that to wear that sales enablement hat and develop the tools, the systems, the processes that will help that sales team succeed. Awesome, thank you. Okay, one last question here. We do have a lot that are coming in, Lee, so I'll share these with okay. you and you can follow up. Um, some of them are a little specific, so I think that might be helpful to have a sidebar conversation with these people. But um, this last one I think is interesting. How do you, and you talked a little bit about this, but um, how do you preserve a relationship after a price disagreement? Okay, so there's really no specifics there, so I'm, I'm gonna have to no. talk big picture. So yeah. the first thing is, coming back to what I said a few minutes ago, this is why I prefer salespeople not to have pricing responsibility, because they can be the intermediary and work with that client uh, in, a, in a healthy way while the client is mad at the company about some, some price <laughs> issue. If they right. see the salesperson as the judge and jury with pricing, they're an extension of the company, not the intermediary, and it, it makes things more challenging to resolve a, a price issue. Um, but there's a whole host of price disagreements. Was it that they thought it was gonna cost X and it was Y? Uh, I, I don't know what it is, so it's hard for me to be any more specific than that. Okay. And honestly, guys, you know, we'll share these questions with Lee as well. So if there is any more clarification, um, we'll make sure that Lee can reach out and get you some more specific answers. Um, I know we've got a large audience in here, so I want to make sure that we're giving as broad of an answer to as many people that they can receive that answer um, as best they can. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, this was an awesome session. I want to give you almost 10 minutes back in your day if you're banking on this hour. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for an our first of many more Lee's lessons. Um, this one specific on price objection, you'll see in the next upcoming weeks, um, a registration page for a variety of them coming up throughout the year. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Lee um, has a couple of places, his, he'll post it, one of his LinkedIn channel, um, also in his newsletter, he'll have it in there as well. So if you follow Lee, definitely have eyes on that. Um, and if you're followers of Zoom Info, we'll have it up on social as well as um, promoting it via email over the next couple of weeks. So definitely keep an eye out for all of that. Um, we're excited to have these going forward. Thanks so much, Lee, for joining us and being a part of another great year for us. Um, we're and excited Rebecca, for the future. One other thing. Yeah, for sure. So the theme of, of this program is Lee's Lessons. If you go to Lee's Lesson Singular, I couldn't get Lee's Lessons.com. If you go to Lee's Lesson.com, you'll see there's a whole host of Lee's Lessons. They're basically posters with little uh, teachings that you can download, print, share with your sales team. Awesome. Yeah, so check that out, Lee's Lesson, not plural, just Lesson. Check that out, and um, we will see you all soon. Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll make sure that that link is in um, the recording email um, you'll receive within the next 48 hours. So recording you'll see within, within the next 48 hours, this target client uh, profile will also be in there as well as the link to Lee's lesson. Um, so definitely check all of those out and have a wonderful day, everybody.